Good morning for our small but faithful group here. It'll be, I'm pretty sure it'll, it'll double in size maybe or at least, let's see, Addie and Sammy, Susie and Max, my wife. At least four more people show up, so not quite though. Good morning, welcome family, but my family specifically. <laughs> but anybody who comes in is family. All right, so I looked up uh, to end, this is the last Sabbath, last day of 2022, so I thought, well, let me, let me give you a, 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 a riddle. This is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you could never get it back. What is it? Time. We're at the end of this year. Some of us are thinking, ah, oh, the time is over. Or if it's at a break of the school year, some of us are like, oh, my time for vacation or winter break is almost over. Or we always think we never have enough time that we have to make this or buy that or go here or do this. Or are we on time to, to church or whatever, someplace. But time is the one thing that is so important, but at the same time, we sometimes don't value it or really appreciate it until it's gone so um, just as this year ends as we're thinking of the new year besides saying what a great way to end our year and then next week start our year then uh here with uh in, in the house of the lord with each other in church and stuff so i think that's pretty cool a good use of our time would be here i think so welcome to modern bay academy church um, our last sabbath of the year and last day of the year too. The next time I'll see you all is a you know, really corny joke that I always do with the kids. Uh, but I won't see you until next year. Oh no. Which is tomorrow. So it's, I tell the kids, oh, I won't see you guys until next year. What? No, because the next time we come back to school, I tell the students is the next calendar year. Oh, okay. Not 12 months. Anyway, I'm sure I'm not the only one who goofs around like that with, with a tie. So anyhow, welcome here. Um, there's no big announcements, just keep in prayer. Um, you know, any, the announcements we normally have, I know Arturo, our pastor is, um, he's, he's out in a, the, um, still GYC? Youth conference, yeah, GYC youth conference. He sent us a picture with some of the kids that went, some of the youth that went. Looks like they're having a good time. It's big, where is that being held? Arizona, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. My old, uh, my old stomping grounds. I used to live in Phoenix. Moved there in the summer, thunderstorms, humid and hot. And it was an experience I'll never, I'll never forget. Opening the door, you got there at nighttime, stay in the hotel, in a little hotel we found, opened the door. At 7 a.m. in the morning, bright sun, it felt like opening the oven door. Like, oh, it's so hot. What did I do? But <laughs> why did I choose this place? I could have gone to like, well, Pomona or Los Angeles, but anyway, uh, but there's, I have some fond memories from there as well, so anyhow, um, so welcome everyone once again, um, and I hope you have a happy Sabbath, we get some good things, our preacher, our speaker, our presenter, our leader today, leading out will be Pastor Daniel Gregory, so I can't wait to hear some good stuff from him, no doubt. Uh, I think right now though, our mission spotlight um, on this 13th Sabbath, mind you, our mission spotlight will be coming from, as I understand it, Australia and the difference that, uh, that each person could do or the, at least, you know, what could we do? And we'll, we've been seeing what people have done when they're impressed and called by the Lord, when you feel that thing that's missing. And this is kind of what we'll see today. So um, let's watch the uh, mission spotlight. Hello, Falava. My name is Aitui Fanene, a pastor of nine churches in Melbourne, Australia. It didn't start with me. It actually started with a small group of dedicated church members with the leadership of Pastor Eddie Erika about 27 years ago now. I serve the community. I serve other people. I serve God. And for me, that is 
the major part of what I do. Third generation Adventist, grew up in the church, served God in the church, but as I continued to, to live my life and, you know, go and travel, started to see some things that uh, were not in harmony with what I believe at that stage. I still believed in God, but I went wild. And it was during that time that I came out of a pub in Wellington and I heard a voice and the voice says, what are you doing here? This is a Friday night. The voice was not uh, judgmental. I just heard this voice which was connected with with, with me, and so um, I turned around and I said, well, God, I knew I've left you, so I'm coming back to you, but not necessarily to the church. When I came here, uh, called to be a minister or a pastor here in Melbourne, I soon find myself in the top of the hierarchical system. I found the picture that Paul has presented in Philippians 2 clearly says that Jesus decided to be a, a servant. When you are there, you are connected. I found it to be something that makes you connect with all the people. So this church, Karam Downs, um, it started off geographically not here, um, but at Nanawading. Then they decided to plant their first church, North Melbourne Church. I've been a Christian all my life. The end of 1992, discussed with Pastor Eddie Erika and some of the elders in the church that we need to plant another Samoan church here on the north side of Melbourne. Now our church planned two more mission hubs. Out of that two mission hubs, they plant another two mission hubs. For my experience, the way I look at it with all these hubs, instead of a pastor doing all this work, we work together to make disciples and God is leading everywhere we go. And that's how we have all these hubs and everything going. We have Karam Downs on the south side. We have North Melbourne on the north side of Melbourne. And now we have Melton, Werribee and Sunshine on the west side of Melbourne. Now we're covering all three corridors of, of Melbourne. They're kind of continuing to change the culture as a result of the training. You know, leaders got equipped and they realised that there is not one way of doing church or ministry. A lot of uh, Discovery Bible reading groups emerged out of these churches. I think this story relates to all other cultures. And I think these, these little small ministries, DBR, Cranburn, and new church plants are trying to reach or bridge the gap. I think that's really cool where yeah, that one church started, or that group started planting other groups and it just kind of grew the difference we can make. Um, one thing I didn't mention is earlier is that um, I really like this weather, the rainy weather. I don't know, it's just me. I just like the sound, the pitter patter of the rain and just seeing everything kind of be, even though there's a hue of gray because of the clouds, it's still green. Just like, oh, everything's alive the birds outside her window with a little bird feeder. It's really cool seeing all that. So I enjoy the rain. And so when I, I, I heard the rain, saw the rain, then, and I knew I, want to, uh, I was going to do the offering call, I remembered, oh, there's that verse in Malachi 3, uh, 310, which I want to read to you. I don't know, just the imagery kind of goes together. So Malachi 310 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out 
for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it as the rain is falling and making puddles or flooding the yard or whatever it might be. That's just a reminder of God's grace, his blessings that he promised to give us when we give back to him, return to him what is his, actually. So for this offering call, well, uh, oh, for this offering call, um, today is the 13th Sabbath, so all our, um, all our offerings for the 13th Sabbath will go towards um, the, this division as well, the, um, oh, I forgot it, but the one, the Southern Asia Pacific, I think, uh, division, which would help with uh, setting up different uh, programs, ministries uh, in these places. And I believe we are going to have Galen pick up our offering. So uh, if you want anything uh, specific as a reminder, anything specific, put on an offering tithe envelope that you want your offering to go to. And remember, it's the last calendar day of the year. So your end of year giving to go for this year, make sure you uh, turn in your offerings uh, today so that could be recorded uh, as necessary. So let's, yeah, let's have a prayer then for this offering. And bow your heads, please. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the rain you, uh, you send us, and thank you for the raining of blessings that you give us as well, Lord. And please bless the offering that we're able to give, that let it go to your ministry and your work so that your truth, your word can be spread to those who need to hear it to hasten your soon coming. Please bless those who are able to give that they can give more next time and those who aren't able to so that they can also have that blessing to be able to give in the future as well. Thank you for everything you do for us and bless all the ministries where these funds will go towards, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> Our scripture today is found in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, if you would like to turn there in your Bibles. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to, to you today and we've gathered together with the rain coming down outside, um, we know that there will be a rainbow somewhere, and we know that's a reminder of your, your presence all around. Be with us now, Lord, as we um, worship together. I ask that you be with Daniel as he presents a message to us. Thank you for all of our church family and wherever they may be today. Um, we ask a special blessing upon them. And I especially think of the teachers and the staff as they prepare for the students to return in another week and be with the students that they will be able to safely return as well. Thank you, Lord, for the many blessings you provided during 2022. And may we dedicate our lives to serve you even greater in 2023. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let's pray. Father God, there is so much more in this text than I could ever know or understand. May some of what you meant for us to see 
come through today. Not just uh, intellectual curiosity, but to change us for the better, for always and forever. Amen. Luke 22, this two little story, text story, pericope, is one of my favorite um, texts to, to preach on. It really is one of the most amazing to me. And I'll tell you why. At the end. When we think of uh, New Year's, at least I think most of us, um, especially this time, our, our thoughts turn towards what we did in the past, how we can make up for it, what we can do in the future. Uh, we get beset by uh, maybe what we accomplished and we want to set new goals, and that's usually the, the whole origin or the impetus maybe behind our New Year's resolutions. We look back at our, our past year and we go, oh man, I wish, I wish I'd have done that differently or I wish I could do this. And, and, and whether it's, it's goals about productivity, or it's, maybe it's goals for work or maybe it's goals for relational goals at home and, or with your kids or with your, your partner or, or maybe it's just spiritual goals of, of personal growth or, or what? And our eyes and our set on a prize and our mind is redoubles and we're going to do it this time. We're going to do it this time. And we set those goals. It's not unique to this culture. The Hebrew culture, for instance, the one that we often draw from, has embedded in it this idea. Now, in the time of the Mosaic, so 2,000 years prior to Jesus coming, you have embedded um, the start of their years, Passover. It's kind of, it was marked on and you know, when they go out and Jesus says to, to Moses, this is going to be the beginning of your months. And it's how you're going to mark time. And they do that. Uh, Nisan is their first month. It's great. But in this day and age, in other words, for the last about 2,000 years, um, rabbis began to shift around the time of Jesus, actually, and make what they call Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, which is now a, a festival that didn't exist. There isn't, a, there isn't a biblical basis. Even the, Judeo, uh, the Judaic traditions say there is no, there is no Torah tradition for it. It's not in the Tanakh. Uh, but the Mishnah began this idea, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the first day of the 10 days of awe. Now, again, some of you are like, what are you talking about? Okay, you all know it, especially as Adventists, because at the end of the 10 days of awe comes the day of atonement, the Yom Kippur. The day of atonement, big deal for Adventists, right? That's the cleansing of the sanctuary and the whole thing all, all wrapped in that. All right, but the whole purpose of the 10 days of awe was to reflect on your past year and to think about being set perfect before God for your next year. In fact, the Jewish tradition takes it a little more farther than I'm necessarily comfortable with. They have embedded in this the idea that, that at the beginning of that, God writes his plan for you in the book of life. And you have 10 days to ratify your covenant with God. At the end of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, when the priest comes out, at the end of the, uh, the, so at the third hour, or the ninth hour, what we call 3 p.m., and, and, and the, the sins are placed on, on the scapegoat, sent out, your fate is sealed. That's your year. That's what it's going to be. You're only ratifying what God's plan is for you. And again, it's a whole reflection of the past and kind of setting for the future. So it kind of has more of a lockdown kind of feeling. But, but this idea is not new. There's all sorts of different cultural traditions across the globe for all in time and purposes. December was the 10th, was the 10 month, there was only 10 months in the, in the Roman calendar, um, and which the Gregorian calendar was based on. And at the end of that, you had the, the new month, January, Janus was two-faced. It's like, what were you going to be? Which side were you going to be? How are you going to face? Uh, Ides is the, you know, March is the beginning of their kind of year, but they, they approached that. So it's, it's totally throughout all cultures. And people will say it's based on the solstice, the idea we all reflect on our past year. What are we going to do different? So I don't think it's unusual that we do that. But why? This is what I kind of began to struggle with. I, I, I realized that for the most part, I look at grace or forgiveness in terms of works. And maybe you do. I don't know if you do or not. But it can be uncomfortable for me. I, I like the story out of John 4. But here's... Why? Let's read the story out of John 4, one of my favorite. Um, if you've ever been in my class or read anything I've written or 
blog post, you know the book of John is by far my favorite. John 4 is the story of the woman at the well. And um, Jesus comes to her, and we don't even learn her name. We learn a lot about her. But the big thing I've heard in sermon after sermon, you know, is that he, tells, he reveals everything to her. So I'm going to pick up with verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water. Because he's just said, I, if, I, if, you've, if you've asked me for water, I will give you, and you'll never have to come back. And she doesn't want to come back. So she's like, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Verse 16. Jesus saith to her, go call thy husband and come hither. 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. 18, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman said unto him, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. That was a great story, and I love going through it with my kids and juniors. And I always point out, he knew all this about her, and he never flinched from talking with her. And when we go through how come she came there at noon and all the way she came by herself and all the kind of, and the kids really get the story and they, they love it. It's one of their favorites. But I think one of the reasons we all like it is because we want that Jesus. We want a Jesus who knows about our past and goes, yeah, I'm not surprised. I love you anyway. And, and that's, I'm not saying that's not a true Jesus. That's exactly who Jesus is. But I think we only take it as far as that. And this was what began to make me uncomfortable this week and last week as I was kind of reading again and again. I want to have grace that covers my past because in a large sense, I view forgiveness in forms of works. And I wrote this down because I didn't want to screw up what I had thought. This is my thought process. And maybe some of you can relate, maybe not. Maybe I'm the only one who's so knee-deep in codependence and control that this is just to me. In which case, okay. I realize I want to be someone people can count on. That is one of my number one things. One of the number one things I measure people by is can I count on them? If I ask them to do something, will they show up? It's one of my favorite traits about Galen and Donna, particularly. I've known them for years, and John right as rain, faithful as the day is long. I know I can count on. That is such a key aspect. And I realized, okay, I want to be somebody to count on. And then I thought, well, part of that is not wanting to be somebody who lets people down. Still not bad. Still not bad. And then I realized that led me to the idea that, well, I'm, sometimes I avoid risks for fear of disappointing somebody because I'd rather not disappoint somebody so I will avoid doing a risk that might end up failing because I don't want to disappoint somebody. So I'm not going to promise to do something unless I know I can do it. You know, under promise, over deliver. Sounds good. Again, thank you, Scotty, from Star Trek. And I realized part of that was because I never want to have to say I'm sorry. And that comes into my relationship as my wife can speak to. I don't want to have to need grace. I don't want to be taking advantage of someone. I don't want a debt to be owed. I don't mind if people owe me. And it's not even a, 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 a quid pro quo thing. It doesn't bother me. Somebody says, oh, I didn't cut, get that in on time. No problem. Kid goes, oh, my homework's late. It bugs me, but it's usually because if it's a habit, I'm trying to look how to help them grow out of that. But if it's like, man, if I got to do work during the summer to help a kid pass, I've never, bl I've not even blinked at that. I don't mind if, you know, you know, Tim, I'm routinely bailing out. I'll, say, oh, I'll owe you. I'm like, don't worry about it. That doesn't bother me. But I don't want to have to owe somebody else. And I realize that that speaks to my desire to have righteousness by works. Because notice what I've done. I've quantized grace. Not qualitized, quantitized. Now, it's not entirely bad not to want to owe somebody. It's not entirely bad to, to not be in debt. I, I think there's wisdom, and I wrote this down. I think there's wisdom that learns a lesson not to repeat. But a view of relationships as quid pro quo makes for a rigid fear. And I went back to the story, and I realized the reason I liked the story is because she'd already screwed up, but God forgave her. I'm like, yes, I want that kind of God if, I, if I've made a mistake. 
but I want to go from the go and sin no more and live that life. And I begin to think, man, have I treated forgiveness in legalistic and work paradigms? If I did something, then what do I pay? Do I think of terms like that? I don't think in terms of grace. And I realize that God speaks to her and says, this is yours, forgiveness, because of who I am. Not because of what you did, because of who I am. You are loved because I am a lover, not because you did anything worth loving. And then I penned words that I have spoken to my class for decades, decades. It's been my mantra mission. Salvation is never about trying to get God to, to love us. That's what we always view. We're like, I'm going to get something to get God's attention. It's like, no, the cross, in fact, Ellen White says, the cross was a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception sin had brought to the heart of God. And what she means by that is God has always felt this way. He didn't forgive you because of the cross. The cross is because he'd already forgiven you. And that's kind of almost a backwards way of thinking. Like, oh, So he was demonstrating. The cross was his demonstration that I already love you. You're already forgiven. And the reason that's a wrestle is because we think of, oh, I did something wrong, and now I'm forgiven for what I did wrong. Right? That's, that's a work. That's a quid pro quo. I did this, then you did this, and then now we're forgiven. I did something. I asked forgiveness. Jesus forgives my sins. And I began to think a little bit more about the view of forgiveness in the book of John. And it led me to two things, one in John, one in Hebrews, and then we'll come back to our story and we'll be done. John chapter 19 has the only passage, only place in the Bible where this is mentioned. John chapter 19 is in verses 30. Jesus is on the cross, and he's gone through. They've offered him vinegar, um, or depends on your translation, um, different things. They offered him first something that had, was like an analgesic with, that had pain meds that were classical uh, to, to numb the pain. Jesus refused that. They offered him something that was just basically biting to sort of uh, kind of keep your, your mouth uh, salivating. He took that. And he says, verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. And the, the word there being used, it is finished, is a, is a Greek word that's only used six times. And every single, five out of six times, five out of six times, it always speaks at the end of the world. At the end of the world, like, we're talking like judgment, like when Jesus comes, you know, that, that's when that word is used, except he uses it here as a future past tense. It is present, finished, but the word is speaking about a, a future event. It's, it's a, what we call a perfect in, in Greek. It's, it's present. Speaking of the future as if it's past, it's kind of like we, we don't have a, an English version of that. The closest we get is something like we say, it is written, which is another way of saying it exists in the now. It is written in past, completed, done, speaking to the future. It's the closest we have to it. John's the only record, writer to record Jesus saying those words and what was finished. And so I, I went back and, and read the chapter on it is finished. Um, to kind of wrap my mind around again, trying to, okay, what was going on? And, and she specifically says, which my sophomores will get an eye insight into when we do Job next um, quarter, that Jesus was speaking not just to the earth, but to all the unfallen worlds. And that all of the angels and all the unfallen worlds knew that that meant, we're done. And for them, done. No more conflict, no more, the, Satan's, Empathy was uprooted. He could no longer do all the things he could. Now, it's just up to earth to figure it out. But what I found interesting was the notion that it's done. And I'm like, well, you're not exactly done. I'm still here. In case you didn't notice, God, we're still in this mess. So finished. What do you mean by finished? Which took me to Hebrews chapter 9, where the writer of Hebrews deals with this very thing. He's talking in Hebrews chapter 9 about this very event, about Jesus' own words of saying, it is finished. What does it mean? And, and by the way, in case you're, you got lost in the weeds, we're still talking about grace, and we're still talking about the story of how Jesus addresses Peter 
And we started with how Jesus addressed the woman at the well and then how Jesus addressed the universe. And we're going to come back to the passage in Luke. But we're close up this it is finished from Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Big, important passage for Adventists, right? That was the whole, oh, the whole 2,300 days cleansing the sanctuary. There's a real, there's a sanctuary in heaven, and we thought it was this, and it wasn't that, and it was the other, and right? That's a big deal, that, test, that passage. But the writer goes on to say, nor yet that he should suffer, should offer himself often as the high priest who enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others. And so the writer's like, okay, in the Old Testament, in the Mosaic temple, in the tabernacle, every time there was somebody, you know, the morning and afternoon, evening sacrifice, and you, you had a sin offering, you brought it, and, and it was offered, and you, you screwed up today, and then you have to do it today, and then you screwed up tomorrow, you have to do it again, and you screwed up the next day, you have to do it again, and over and over and over. And he's like, but, but that's not how Jesus did things. As a high priest who entered in the holy place every year with the blood of others. For if that was the case, I'm a little paraphrasing here, I'm reading from King James. For then must he have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. The writer says, well, but that's not what happened. But now, once in the end, and there's that word again. It's the same word. All speak of this as the end of the world except for this. But now in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And we know that that's not the end of the world, but the writer of Hebrews is saying, for all intents and purposes, that's it. When it all comes down a million years in the future, when we talk about earth, it's like, oh, man. And you remember that battle? Poof, that was it. All the rest is details. I'm like, well, okay, God, I, I kind of sort of get that, but... I'm living in the, in the tail end of this. Yeah, it's finished, but uh, I haven't gotten there yet. And it leads me back to Luke. We're going to take a little longer. I'm going to try to give you some of the Greek behind it because I think it will be important for you to see what is invisible in English. So, back to Luke 22. Two verses, just two verses. Jesus turns to... Um, and by the way, I put the, the NIV, which, thank you, Donna, uh, for reading so well, does a good job of translating here because it's a little unclear in the King James. King James says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And that sounds singular, but the NIV, if it's up there, has desired to sift all of you. That implies, and that's exactly what happens. In the Greek, Jesus... Peter's just, you know, said something, and Jesus says, Peter, Peter let, me, let me talk to you. He addresses Peter personally, but he uses the plural. So he's saying to Peter as a spokesperson for the, for the whole, watch the dynamics, because some of this is, becomes really kind of, he, Peter, Peter, let me tell you, Satan has asked me to have all of you sift you like wheat. But then he's going to change. The, verse, the next verse says, but I have prayed for thee. Now he addresses Peter directly. Singular. Plural. Satan has asked for all of you. But I've prayed for you, Peter. So when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. Now, embedded in that, I've prayed for you because you're going to screw up. And I already know it. But notice what else is embedded in there. And when you return... His journey back, his forgiveness back is already embedded. Now let's back up a little more. The word sift is unique. It's only used once here because it's not actually a, a, a Hebrew notion. It's actually a Persian word that crept into the, the notion of the Greek. And the word is the, what we would use for sift. Sift, uh, they would use a word for like uh, to, to, to harrow or to, 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 pharaoh, to, to, to throw up wheat and kind of thing. But that's not the word that's being used. He uses the, the word here that the, the writer Luke, who was fairly well educated, uses the word for a sieve. It's a chokehold. It's not, it's not necessarily for winnowing, right? A sieve doesn't ha necessarily have, we think of it like a colander, but it's not necessarily a filter. It's, it's to choke down like a funnel, to choke down the flow. 
That's the word he's using. And they translated it as sift because it's like, well, we, we think that's probably what he's trying to say. But something else is going on here. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, but I have prayed. I want to put those two together. The word he uses for Satan desired has in its root beg, but it's beg from a craving. It's, it's, it's to want something so bad you can taste it. It's, it's that. In fact, they even use the same prefix in these two words, which is fascinating. Because the word for prayer that Jesus uses is, is also a form of beg, but it's where you beg for another who is unable. You come as a spokesperson and you bind yourself to them. You make yourself legally responsible for their debt. That's the word that Jesus uses that gets translated here as prayer, which is not necessarily the normal word for prayer. So again, in the, in the original, hear what is being said. Peter, I got news for you, man. You all. Satan wants you all going down, and you're going to go down. I know it. And because of that, I am willing to bind myself to you for your debt that you haven't even incurred yet. Satan's begging, and I'm begging. But we have two very different goals in mind. One is begging for mastery. One is begging to stand for your debt. We're not done yet. That thy faith fail not. Now, interesting, the word uh, is eklepo, from which we get the word eclipse. So literally, your faith fail not. It's not just that it, it falters. It literally means to be completely shut out. Especially in the time of, of this, an eclipse was like this mystical, magical, somebody turned off the sun, it's all going to hell. And he uses the word that your faith be not eclipsed. That your faith be not blotting out of the sun. It's an extreme word. And it's only used here. And when thou art converted, okay, now this is just cool. As soon as I was kind of reading through the Greek, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I didn't realize that. And it's so funny because when you go through it, you, you know, you had years of training. You, you forget things and you read things and you that kind of thing. But the word is epi, <laughs> strebgo. Now, epi is like we have an epipen or epidermis. It means a pond. And so the word literally, it says, when, when you are converted, we think of that in terms of, you know, when you've made your 180, you've made your, you know, you've made your payback. But it actually means epi, it means on the turn. It's like on the cusp. It's not just like, okay, when you're all sanctified and holy and all that, then you can impact your, 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 your brothers. No, he's actually saying, he's like, when you're on that, just, just when you start to turn, I need you to do this. And one of the things that I found interesting about the, the Mission Spotlight was the guy found meaning when he began to do something for others. He didn't wait until he was sanctified because that's not going to happen that way. And I think this is fascinating. We sometimes, well, I, I, can't, I can't serve in church because I'm not, I don't know, I'm not been in church for 10 years or something. Whatever, whatever thing we tell other people, you have to have been this for, you, before you can be a deacon. And it's like, and Jesus actually uses the, when you're just on that, when you're just turning around on the cusp of your repentance. I need you to do this. He gives him a task after his failure when he hasn't even failed yet. Strengthen thy brethren. Now, strengthen is a, um, a compound word in Greek. Um, it's put together of istemi, from which we get like histamines, uh, like uh, antihistamines, and uh, stergo, which... We use the word for steroids. It comes from that. So I just finished off my course. I had a whole week of, of steroids um, because that was the only thing that cleaned up the lungs and all the stuff. And I was like reading this going, oh my goodness. I, I know what you're saying here, Jesus. I, I get it. Because the word is a combination. And stregizo, which we get to steroids, comes from not just to stand, and firm. It's to stand, but then to be unmovable. So to strengthen isn't, isn't like I'm going to build a support. It's to stand firm behind, to provide that for them. 
And what I love about this text is this is what I think grace is. This is forgiveness and assurance before the act. He's not like, okay, you've forgiven, you, you know, you've screwed up, come, you can come ask me for forgiveness. I am forgiving you because I'm a forgiver. I love because I'm a lover. And I already know what you're going to do, and I've forgiven you already. The hardest thing for me to wrap my mind around, particularly younger, but still, is that how can God forgive me for things that I haven't done yet? Well, that's what the cross is. And here we see it acted out before the cross has even happened. He comes to Peter. He says, Peter, this is going to go down really bad, and I already know that. I'm not happy about that, but I'm okay. Here's something I need you to do. When you return, Forgiveness was already promised before he even made the mistake. So I thought, what if we looked at grace that way? What if we looked at our New Year's resolutions that way? What if instead of approaching the years, oh, man, look at my past year. If I can set it behind us. I remember we had one particular uh, bad year, and uh, so did my uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law. And so what we got to do together on one um, New Year's Eve night was... They had this, uh, for whatever reason, it, it, it doesn't make sense, you know, but it was symbolic for all of us. We took a ceramic black cat and we smashed the smithereens out of it because we just all had a horrible year and our thing was we're going to break the bad luck. That was the kind of thinking. But think about that. What that says is forgiveness is quid pro quo. I did this, then if I do this act, then God will can forgive and I can move on. But what if God has already forgiven for what I'm gonna do in 2024. And yes, I said 2024, because that's not even next year. He approaches Peter and says, Peter, Satan wants you, he craves you. I crave you too, but we have different goals. What if in fact grace is just that? What if the gift of a new start is accepting that you're already loved and living like you're loved. What if that's the message of Jesus talking to Peter? Not a na na na, I told you so, I knew you're gonna screw up. I'm gonna keep that in front of you all your life. What if instead it was hearing those original words? Satan's gonna try to choke you off like a sieve, he's gonna try to strangle hold. He wants you so desperately, but I do too. And I know you're going to make mistakes, and I know you're going to fall. But I'm going to fall with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to hold your hand with you. Take that into the new year, Peter. Take that into this great conflict. Maybe that's what the days of awe, as we go towards the Day of Atonement, is about. Maybe it was thinking about, yes, I did this, but God in the book of life has me. Maybe my new year is about learning to live like he already sees me, not trying to be somebody who I don't owe him anything. Could be. Maybe it's just me. But uh, that was my epiphany going through the passage and finding it fascinating. So if you found something beautiful and blessed, <laughs> praise God for it. And if you didn't, Sometime maybe it'll knock on you know your door, but maybe take that into the new year. Maybe that's what a new start means. Maybe it means just learning to live loved and not worrying about quid pro quo. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Bless these people. Bless your children. Thank you for the beautiful lights. Thank you for the dry roof. Thank you for listening to the rain on the outside and yet being warm on the inside. Thank you for all the sacred events that will happen in this space today. In your name, amen.